rolling if you're uh, ready to go. Hey, I got to say before we start, life ain't always sunshine and unicorns. It, dude, it doesn't sound right. You said sunshine and unicorns. You say it to me. Life isn't always unicorns and rainbows, man. Okay. Sometimes you got to do a Dune Steve episode. I, I am learning that. So there is still hell on earth somewhere. All right. <laughs> I love that Dune Steve audio fiction magazine. And now here's your host, Rich Outfield and Big Anklevich. Hey everybody, this is Big Anklevich. Welcome to another episode of the Dune Steve audio fiction magazine. Here with me is... Uh, Rich Outfield? That's right. That is your moniker that you go by on this misguided podcast that we do. We're back again today with another story for you guys to listen to, and I think you're going to enjoy it. It's almost like the good old days when we would do this on a weekly basis instead of a bi-monthly basis. Yeah, I don't. I do. Did we even manage bi-monthly this year? We're just going to say that we do oh, okay. and not remind anybody that we haven't managed that. <laughs> but yeah, this is uh, like the old days, like the Dune Steef when it was uh, in its prime, so to speak. The Dune Steef of yore. There you go. <laughs> Dune Steef classic. Ooh. Because it's, um, <clears throat> it's a story <laughs> that we have obtained to run on the show and... It, am I right? It is full cast. Oh yeah, that's right. It is full cast. Okay, so yeah, it's just it's 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 nice. So um, tell us uh, about this story real quick. Who, who is it by? What's it called? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so the story today is called "The Slender Men," and it's by David Eric Nelson. Okay, and a couple months back, I did a story for. Pseudopod, the horror podcast. The story was called Whatever Comes After Calcutta. It was a really, really good story. I suggest you check it out. And After finishing this podcast? No, instead. Instead. Oh. Because, yeah. <laughs> and it was by David Eric Nelson. And I liked it enough that I thought, I'm going to check this guy's blog out. And so I went, you know, just to see what else he's done. And he's, he's, he's done a lot of stuff uh, on other podcasts and on, you know, non-podcasting things. Like actually putting out books and selling stories to magazines. Oh, wow. I know. To me, that is just completely foreign. Yeah. Because podcasting is our world. So on his website, he had links to where you could hear the various podcasts that had done his stuff or read like websites where there were free stories. And one of the links was to uh, the story called the slender men. And I read it and I, I, well, I will talk about what I thought afterward, but I emailed him and said, Hey, I wonder if the audio rights are tied up. Uh, and if not, can we tie them? <laughs> and he knew who I was. Oh, wow. And he, uh, he said, yeah. Oh, hey, try to uh, sound a little less shocked. Okay, <laughs> okay let me... Um, yeah, of course he did. Okay, that, that's better. He uh, <laughs> mentioned uh, a story that I had done called Free Balloons for All Good Children. Oh, yeah, I remember that story, too. And he remembered that, and, and I, that's a story that I had narrated for another podcast, too, and said, yeah, go ahead. So here we are. I guess that I guess that's all I have to say. Do do we need to talk about it or just? No, I, I think we should run the story before we do much more talking about it. Tell us a little bit about the author. Does he have some kind of, I don't know, some kind of acceptable bio that we could read? Barely acceptable. Screw you guys. About the author. Uh, <laughs> uh, David Eric Nelson is an award-winning science fiction and horror writer. And essayist. Ooh, he's an essayist. Wow. His fiction has appeared in Asimov's, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, the best horror of the year, 
and the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. <laughs> Uh, find his fiction online at www.davideric with a k nelson.com. Yeah, be sure to hit that website after you're done listening to this podcast. Yeah, like and subscribe. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, and be sure to smash that like button. <laughs> You've been on YouTube too long, sir. <laughs> Have you ever actually told somebody to smash the like button no i i'm predisposed to not do that okay um some other time when we're not recording i'll tell you a story about mashing a button (laughs) then you you'll understand that i should never have even brought the story up to begin with because it wasn't even a good story okay uh (laughs) yeah I'm, i'm i'm used to being mashed and the button is unfriend (laughs) all right well here comes the story folks hope you enjoy it and we'll talk some more about it on the other side the slender men by david eric nelson james hodge would later claim to have immediately liked the slender young woman who stopped him in the bustling lobby of the mount pleasant double tree hotel and conference center But that wasn't true. And it wasn't just because Hodge wasn't much of a people person. Even before she spoke, even before she'd stopped him, the young woman in the awful glasses had made him nervous. Puzzling over this later, Hodge decided that what had made him nervous was the way that she'd approached him. Not obsequious or shy or aloof or uncertain, but with the trotting confidence of the predator advancing on prey that has no hope of escape, an absurd first impression that evaporated as soon as the girl extended her hand for a smirkingly ironic parody of the businessman's double-pump handshake. "'Professor Hodge?' she asked. Hodge nodded and didn't bother to correct her. Ninety percent of the time, when someone addressed him as Professor, that person was ultimately both confused and annoyed by any correction. Hodge could see where these folks were coming from. What the hell were they supposed to call him? Three-year renewable contract lecturer Hodge? Stuck on the non-tenure-track hamster wheel educator Hodge? Besides, Being mistaken for an actual professor on a bright October afternoon by a young woman in god-awful glasses and a flippy, summery skirt, well, that was far from the worst indignity suffered by short, overweight folklorists from third-tier Indiana corn colleges. My name is Katie Kay. She had a large purse slung across her chest and clutched a small journal in both hands. She was young for an academic conference— Hodge assumed she wrote for the school paper at Central Michigan University, which was hosting this annual meeting of the American Skeptical Society. You gave the Slenderman talk yesterday afternoon? Yes, Hodge replied, smiling. Well, no, I I mean, I did make passing mention of the Slender Man, singular, in yesterday's presentation, because of my more recent work. But that was an aside. I was invited to speak about late 19th and early 20th century spirit photography, which is the area of my expertise. You're the guy claiming slender men are a hoax. The word claim clanged in Hodge's ear, and he proceeded cautiously. Ms. K., the slender man, is a hoax. An internet photo manipulation meme begun in June 2009 by someone using the pseudonym Victor Surge. That's documented. It's not a hoax, the girl said simply. And Vic's pictures weren't photoshops. They were mine. Your art, Hodge suggested. My snapshots from my dad. Hodge's heart raced. A chill frisson swept over Hodge. He indicated a secluded pair of leather-wing-backed chairs, leaning together conspiratorially to either side of a tiny side table, dominated by a large pumpkin. "'Let's take a second to sit and chat,' he said. "'You'd like a Danish, a coffee?' 
the young woman brightened as only an undergrad can at the offer of free pastry. Coffee with cream and sugar and something to munch, please. Hodge bustled back to the panelists' hospitality suite, where he filled a paper Starbucks cup with generic hotel coffee, topped it with skim milk, dumped in sugar, and plated two blueberry danishes. He quick walked back to the lobby, half expecting the girl to have disappeared, or his colleagues to have gathered to rib him for being such a rube, and at a conference for skeptics, no less. But she had not left the cozy corner, nor had she spawned co-conspirators. The thin girl sat upright, dwarfed by the deep chair, her large bag at her feet like a faithful hound. She held the little black journal beneath crossed palms, pinned to her lap as though it was liable to flutter off on its own. What do you think you know about Slender Men? She asked as he handed her the coffee and set the plate of Danish on the edge of the tiny side table. The question nettled Hodge. First, it smacked of someone preparing to tell him his business. And even more so than with spirit photography, there was almost certainly no one in the world whose familiarity with the Slender Man mythos exceeded his own. And second, because this girl, Ms. KDK, kept using the plural. Man, Hodge corrected settling into his chair and adjusting his belt and trousers so as not to pinch his girth. It's the Slender Man. The character was introduced to the Internet on June 10th, 2009 by a Something Awful Forums member calling him, or herself, Victor Surge, which you clearly already know. This was part of a photoshopping thread dedicated to creating paranormal images. The girl had already downed half of her coffee and set the cup down. She plucked up one of the danishes and tore a long curl from its side, like a cat peeling back a strip of flesh from an abandoned carcass. She smiled absently as her teeth and tongue made contact with the glistening pastry. The gesture, which was unexpectedly graceful, fascinated and distracted Hodge. He cleared his throat and leaned back in his chair, away from the hungry girl before going on. Serge's photos depicted an improbably tall, improbably gaunt character. In contrast to most other postings in that thread, this character was tucked into the background of these images, as though captured accidentally. In the photos, the figure is blurry and appears to wear a dark suit. Its facial features are indistinct, possibly entirely absent, The Slender Man's height varies wildly from picture to picture, especially now that Serge is no longer the sole author of the works. Seven to ten feet tall seems like a fair range, but I've seen pictures in which the Slender Man figure appeared to be at least fifteen feet tall. That's quite a tall man to not notice looming about the fringes of your wintertime hike, don't you think? The question was rhetorical. Hodge was a college lecturer— and accustomed to speaking in uninterrupted thousand-word runs. But the girl answered anyway. You can miss a lot of things if you aren't expecting to see them, she said, carefully peeling back another strip of Danish. There were all sorts of naked ladies in the first few Where's Waldo books, but no one noticed for years. She took a small bite and swallowed. No one that made decisions, I mean. Kids noticed, but no one really took that seriously. Then finally someone saw what their kids had been telling them was there, and there was this big stink. The publisher had to touch up a bunch of the art for the reprints. No one believes me about that, but it's true. When I was a kid, I only had these beat-up library sale copies of the Where's Waldos, and there was some pretty rank stuff tucked into those drawings. Topless chicks, torture, murder, a guy about to get raped by a lion. That's absurd, Hodge said disoriented by the conversation's twisted trajectory. Those are children's books. The young woman smiled wryly. Like I said, no one believes me about that when I tell them. Google it. The world is full of things that are basically invisible because they don't fit people's expectations. She took another smiling bite of pastry. She was sharp, this girl. If one of his colleagues had asked, 
Hodge would have said he'd love to have a student like this, someone with a hungry mind ready to lock its jaw on whatever text wandered too close. But he again wondered if he'd really enjoy having her in class. It might be thrilling to spar with her at first, but he suspected that before long he'd feel like he was trapped in the center ring with a lioness that had realized the trainer only had a wooden stool and blanks in his pistol. Yes, Hodge grudgingly acknowledged. But what about the human tendency, maybe even more aptly a compulsion, to find patterns where there are none? The blurs in the background become faces, the murmurs of an oscillating fan become muttering voices, and so on. We don't only miss things we don't expect to see, we also find things we do expect to see even when they aren't there. And that's what you think the Slendermen are, right? A muttering fan, a smear on the film? What else would it be? Even suggesting it's a hoax is nonsense. It's like saying Star Wars was a hoax. The Slenderman is a work of fiction, a work of art, which is to say it's a creative expression of deeply seated human anxieties. She'd somehow already finished the Danish, without getting a crumb on her, and was rummaging through her oversized purse. Katie Kay came up with a plastic pouch of trail mix and began munching. Then how is it that all sorts of people are accidentally taking their own pictures of Slenderman now? It's all over the internet. I've never heard of anyone suddenly noticing Yoda or Chewie lurking in the background of their New Year's Eve selfie, but lots of people find Slenderman lurking in their photo streams these days. Hodge smiled and relaxed. The conversation had meandered back into his domain. Well, some of those are photoshops too. Regardless of what anyone claims, the manipulated photos are actually pretty easy to spot. But I grant that there are an increasing number of genuine Slenderman photos appearing in the wild and that the people who find the Slender Man loitering in the distant background of one of their family photos honestly and legitimately believe that what they see in that photo is real. That's what's so wonderful about the Slender Man phenomenon. Hodge leaned back now, adjusting his belt and sport coat as he did so. As it turns out, there's a very common flaw in the CCD light sensors at the heart of many mid- to low-grade digital cameras, and it creates blurred vertical striations that, in the right conditions, can quite convincingly look like a tall, dark figure. It's a phenomenon not unlike the internal reflections and light leaks that plagued low-end Eastman Kodak brownies, giving us such a rich variety of ghost photographs in the 1930s and 1940s. The young woman seemed unimpressed. Hodge faltered. Most iPhones have just such faulty CCD sensors. You were at my panel. She shook her head. Oh, I'd assumed. Well, let me show you my final slide. He dug out his phone, turned it on, and swiped through several photos. The vertical striation error, uh, the um, slender man effect, if you will, it's readily reproducible. See, this is the picture I included at the end of my PowerPoint presentation yesterday. The photo showed Hodge standing in the hotel conference center's parking lot, washed in the golden October light of late afternoon. Judging from the weather and his herringbone jacket, which he still wore, the picture was taken the day before. Hodge was in the foreground, capped with a set of Mickey Mouse ears and a big, goofy tourist smile. The hotel was in the distant background, flanked by maroon-leafed Japanese maples. Look twice and it was hard to miss the gaunt, indistinct figure looming among those flaming leaves, its pale, misshapen head level with the second-floor windows. Even backlight is really the key, he offered, plus sudden background movement. I made this by asking the concierge to toss a cantaloupe in the air with a strip of black plastic garbage bag pinned to it. 
but all manner of vertical movements can trigger the effect. A falling bird or branch or clump of snow, a rising balloon or plastic bag. She leaned forward to retrieve her cup of coffee. Hodge was struck by a warm wave of air carrying the intimate honeysuckle smell of her soap or body wash or whatever they called it now. You're saying this is why more and more people are seeing Slenderman? She said. It's just because we all have the same crappy camera phone? Katie twisted the final phrase scornfully. He slid the phone back into his pocket and shrugged. I wouldn't say it's just because we all carry around the same low-cost digital cameras. I think that whoever created the Slender Man was a very lucky genius. The original Slender Man photos are excellent works of craftsmanship. Instead of inserting elements into photos, the creator found pictures which were already menacing, slightly blurry photos showing crowds of somewhat distressed-looking children, unposed pictures with no clear intent, and subtly reworked background elements, smearing and blending existing areas of light and shadow in a way that human minds would find irresistible. Speaking strictly in terms of the artist's craft, it is exemplary work. As for the lucky part, he continued, what do you think of when you hear Wendigo? Hodge was both relieved and disappointed when this word provoked only a blank look. Um, those RVs? She hazarded. Hodge smiled pedantically. Those are Winnebago's, Ms. K. She blushed, and Hodge rushed to reassure her. But it's an understandable mistake, since both are Algonquin words. Winnebago is the Algonquin name for the Ho-Chunk people, their neighbors in the upper Midwest. And it's from the Algonquin nation, most notably the Ojibwe, native to this region, that we learn of the Wendigo. So, apart from RVs, what do you think of when you hear Wendigo? Maybe a Yeti Bigfooted thing? I think there was a Wendigo in a Scooby-Doo I saw as a kid. Or an X-Files. Something big, pale, and shaggy. Okay, that's a good start. Wendigo has basically become a synonym for Yeti. I blame the orthographical similarity to the Yeti-like wampa that Luke battles on the ice planet Hoth. But the creature described by the Ojibwe was nothing like that. Their Wendigo is a tall, gaunt figure associated with winter, gloom, and starvation. It is a cannibal, but it cannot be satisfied because with each person it devours, it grows even taller. It is an ever-yawning maw of want that can never be filled. To anyone who's overwintered in the upper Midwest, the mythical Wendigo is a fairly intelligible personification of seasonal famine. It's been a long time since famine stalked this land. He pointedly looked first at his Danish on the side table, then at his ample gut. But over the last decade, I'd argue that we've grown increasingly frightened of a new sort of famine. The Wendigo is thus an apt boogeyman for our age, isn't it? In a land of plenty where so many people are economically starved and the landscape is invisibly stalked by deathless debt monsters which devour all, yet are never satisfied. The girl looked drawn, her lips pressed to a thin, pale line. She sipped her coffee again, as though to warm herself. Her sudden pallor worried Hodge, but the notion that he'd struck a nerve also excited him, tickling some deep hunter's instinct. The parallels between the Slender Man and Wendigo are fairly obvious. It had been my hypothesis that Surge, or whoever had created the Slender Man, had done so with the Algonquin myth as a model, that more than the craftsmanship, this was this lucky genius's true genius, 
crafting a monster that so perfectly personified this neglected and once again very vital universal archetype. The luck came in the fact that his, or or her, pitch-perfect reintroduction of the Wendigo into popular culture just so happened to be so easily evoked by a relatively common digital camera malfunction. He, or she, gave us something to see in that digital noise, and that gave us a way to articulate a powerful and ubiquitous modern dread. Katie Kay finally opened her little journal. Hodge expected her to jot down what he'd said, but instead she removed something he hadn't seen in almost twenty years. A Polaroid snapshot. He smiled despite himself. (laughs) That's from an SX-70 land, he marveled, immediately identifying the camera model from the dimensions of the white-framed picture it had produced. I had one once. (laughs) I loved that camera. It had leather kerf skins, rubber bellows, and a really nifty split focus. As she handed him the photo, Hodge realized how long it had been since he'd handled a Polaroid picture. They never came up in his research, because there were very few paranormal Polaroid snapshots. The self-contained, quick-developing film pack made Polaroid photos notoriously hard to manipulate while the high-quality optics and short exposure made them resistant to the visual artifacts that people insisted on interpreting as ghosts and monsters. If that's true, she said quietly, if these Slendermen are half prank, half coincidence, a collective delusion we pluck out of the digital background noise, either because they are carefully crafted to take advantage of a forgotten universal archetype, or because they happen to so aptly personify our ubiquitous modern dread of economic famine, or a little of both, then please explain this. He expected the content of the picture to be as old as the camera that took it. Instead, the picture showed a newish, burgundy scion hatchback parked just at the edge of a narrow dirt road. Behind the car was a seemingly endless break of young birches. The photo was fairly gloomy. Perhaps it was early evening on a cloudy day, giving the birch backdrop the look of a smudged barcode. Then he saw why she'd been so careful with this photograph. Hodge was speechless. This was, he realized, the photograph he'd been unwilling to admit to himself he'd been hunting for ever since he'd laid eyes on that first startling Slenderman photoshop. I took it myself last week, she offered trying to coax a response. When Hodge finally spoke, his voice was flat and distant, hardly his voice at all. Where? Where did you even get film for an SX-70? Some guys in Brooklyn started making it after Polaroid stopped, she said. It's pricey, like five bucks per shot, but it was an investment. I wanted people like you to believe with as little bullshitting around as possible. The thing she wanted him to believe, with the minimum amount of bullshitting, was that the internet-famous Slender Man, which Hodge was making a career of explaining away as nothing more than the confluence of cheap hardware, overactive imaginations, and ancient myth, was real. Ms. Katie Kay leaned forward and tapped her decidedly non-digital photo, indicating something in the background. Rearing up from that break of bare birches was a slender man. This was different than any other slender man Hodge had ever seen, and he'd have wagered that he'd seen more of these photos than anyone who had ever lived. The slender man shown here was taller than average, almost twenty feet tall, but that wasn't its most striking feature. What was most striking was that this slender man was moving. It writhed against the gray, depthless sky, its head thrown back as though in agony, its arms blurred by the speed with which they whipped around the figure. Every other slender man depiction Hodge had ever seen had shown the figure stock still, statuesque and staring fixedly, because that was all the CCD's vertical striation error could produce. And that was the aesthetic that Slenderman photoshoppers had collectively embraced, 
just as ancient Egyptian artists had always depicted their subjects in profile. What Katie Kay was showing him was not a trick of the light and mind, not a digital blur, not a fake. It was a real picture of a real slender man, and Hodge had no idea how it could possibly exist. Where? he asked, but found himself out of breath and tried again. <clears throat> the location where you saw this, it's near here. The young woman was clearly delighted Hodge had asked. Yes, she said. Well, near here by Michigan standards. I took these in Sanilac. Hodge blanched. Near the petroglyphs? She cocked her head, confused. The what? Native American, um, rock carvings. He expanded, his thoughts elsewhere. Late woodland period pictographs. Some warning of, uh, mythical creatures. You've been to Sanilac? She asked cautiously. Hodge, preoccupied, didn't notice. He didn't even answer. It's about two hours away, she offered. But an easy two hours. You've got a car? He did. As Hodge drove through the sprawling soy fields of Michigan's Thumb, Ms. Katie Kay explained about the elusive Victor Surge, who was actually Victoria Sturgeon, a name that, to Hodge, sounded more made up than her pseudonym. The girls had lived together for about a semester while they were both studying at the University of Michigan. Then one day Ms. Sturgeon had abruptly moved to New York, taking a seemingly random assortment of Ms. Kay's property with her. It's more a bitter thing than a criminal thing. Katie Kay plucked a twist of jerky from a Ziploc bag she'd dug out of that seemingly bottomless messenger bag. I didn't have much valuable stuff. A crappy laptop, a decent stereo. But she didn't even touch those. She took my favorite old books, though, and some cool vinyl I had. My high school yearbooks. These cute barrettes that I found at a thrift shop. Stuff you don't miss till you can't find it, and then you're pissed off all over again. Among the things Victor Victoria stole were some old snapshots. My dad had them, she said between bites. His folks were farmers, and he tried to do that for a while, too. A few of the pictures were old. Those were the ones that Vic posted with her Slender Man stuff. But there were some other ones, ones Daddy had taken himself, too. Three of those, all clearer than the ones Vic used. The way he told it, he'd see Slender Men once every other season or so, when he was hunting in the late fall. They never came close, never seemed to notice him sitting up in his deer stand, but they'd stalk through the misty, bare forest like circus stilt men, always seeming to be in sort of a rush to get where they were going. It was awful luck to glimpse one, he said, because it meant he'd have to move his blind. The deer wouldn't come back through where the Slender Men had walked. Hodge nodded his compulsion to believe in Ms. Kay's improbable slender men growing stronger with each passing mile. The future Victor Surge and Ms. Kay had held a Halloween dinner party in their small apartment, as, evidently, was the fashion that year among attractive young people with criminally ugly spectacles. Katie had trotted out the pictures and her father's stories to great acclaim. In the mellow haze of camaraderie and candlelight— made all the mellower by the rapid emptying of several bottles of cheap red wine, it was easy to portray the slender men as delightfully creepy. It was easy to forget the terror she'd felt as a girl, watching the featureless faces floating past her bedroom window on snow-dusted, moon-bright November evenings, her stomach growling because she and her father had shared another dinner solely consisting of food pantry cereal with powdered milk. Your father's home is near here? Could we visit him? I'd love to ask if... The girl seemed startled. No. I mean, he... He wouldn't like that. Daddy's a... He's a private guy. The miles rolled past, the fields dense, but the farms themselves seeming all but abandoned. Hodge was careful to keep his eyes locked on the road ahead, but still, the girl's profile was distracting. 
The high, sweet smells of her jerky and her soap and her body filled the car. Hodge felt aroused and ridiculous. He watched her chew, his eyes sliding over her slender neck, fascinated by the tendons working beneath her pale, clear skin. Hodge finally broke the silence by asking, "'And Ms. Sturgeon?' as though their conversation had only lapsed long enough for everyone to sip coffee. I didn't really understand until later, but we ended up getting in a big fight a week or so after the party. It was about some other stuff, but really it was about how much everyone had dug on the Slenderman stories. She was in a writing program, but her fiction... I mean, they were beautiful stories, but they were sort of beautiful foggy meditations. You'd turn the page and there'd be no more pages, and you'd say to yourself... I guess that was the end. There wasn't any there there, you know? And she didn't take criticism well. Anyway, I don't think she stole the Slender Men photos on purpose. She just took a bunch of stuff to fuck with me. But when she found them, I guess something finally clicked. The creepypasta she wrote to go along with the pictures was new. Not stuff I said that night. And it was good, but still, fuck her, you know? She got New York and a TV deal. I got stuck with our lease and had to drop out and move home to Sanilac County. Hodge was only half listening, his attention divided between the images of slender men dancing in his head and Katie Kay's teeth and lips and tongue as she gnawed at the dried meat. Nonetheless, something in his posture gave the impression that he shared her indignation. Yeah, I know, right? I heard she's laying low because she's working on a deal with AMC to do a series like Breaking Bad, but in Great Recession, Michigan, and with Slenderman shoehorned in. Which kind of burns me worse than anything, because now it's like she's swiping the rest of my life. I mean, she's from fucking New Hampshire, for fuck's sake. Katie said New Hampshire the way a world-weary fifth grader might say kindergarten. Oh! She exclaimed. Here, turn in up here. The trees had steadily overtaken the open soy fields as she spoke, and now she was pointing at an unmarked two-track winding back into the color-soaked birches. Hodge slowed, turned in, then slowed further. The road was deeply rutted and cratered with water-filled potholes. It was not the ideal terrain for his dinged-up little hybrid. Katie rolled down the window, letting in the autumn spice of dry leaves and wet earth. They'd slowed enough that the car had kicked into silent all-electric mode. Hodge could hear the wickering of the tall grass against the car's spinning drive shaft. As they rolled deeper into the woods, the old pines grew taller. It was cold in their shadows, a premature winter that robbed the birches of their fiery leaves and left the ground frost crisp. The breeze coming in Katie's window had teeth. Here, she said and Hodge parked and killed the motor without a word. She was out of the car as soon as it rocked into park, and Hodge followed without thinking. This is where I took the Polaroid. Hodge rotated slowly, momentarily awestruck, and then almost immediately sheepish at being awestruck. It was just a copse of birches shaded by towering old jack pines, indistinguishable from hundreds of similar spots in the forest. The pieces came together for Hodge with quiet inevitability. Katie Kay, who was so pale and slender and hungry. Katie Kay, who had sought him out with such confidence. Katie Kay, who was so certain that there were physical slender men, plural, haunting these woods, not just a single digital slender man haunting blurry photos. A frigid, silent breeze washed over him noisome with the smell of rot and corruption. Hodge turned to look at Ms. Katie Kay. Clouds occluded the sun. The girl seemed to grow subtly taller in the dim chill, paler, even more slender. Professor Hodge? She asked, her voice hollow and echoing through the abandoned void wilderness. He closed his eyes, tipped his head back, and held his arms wide, preparing to release himself into her long, cold, mutually devouring embrace, the perfectly apt communion he never could have imagined a few hours earlier. But it did not come. Instead, the wind abruptly picked up, becoming a moan, and then a shriek, 
Hodge's eyes involuntarily sprang open. The trees were perfectly still. There wasn't even a breeze, but the wind shrieked more fiercely yet. To Hodge's surprise, Ms. Katie Kay, young and slim and pale, but not remotely supernatural, still stood where she had, watching him uncertainly, a hip little plastic 35-millimeter camera in hand. The cloud passed and the air brightened, then cracked with the sound of enormous bat wings unfurling and beating furiously against the damp, pine-shaded air, questing for the bright sky. Hodge spun and craned back. It was more horrible, more awful, than he could have anticipated. Black, and lean and lithe, its head and shoulder were well above the naked birches. It did not walk as he had expected, but instead twitched and swayed and convulsed against the clear blue sky, its arms whipping and cracking, its whole body bowing back and then wrenching forward as though in agony. Its faceless face was flung to the sky in a silent scream. It was awful, and it was beautiful, and it was real and here for him, and not at all what he'd expected. Hodge's heart pounded in his ears, deafening him, making his vision throb. His hands flew reflexively to his cheeks. His head swam, his throat clicked with tiny little trapped rabbit cries. Although he could not hear these over this slender man's terrible, constant, keening moan, a moan that never drifted in pitch or flagged in volume, never paused for a breath. Almost, Hodge thought desperately, ludicrously, struggling to hold himself together. Almost like a vacuum cleaner. And then the other sounds seeped in. His pitiful squeaks came first. And then Katie Kay's snorts of suppressed laughter. And then the clack and whirr of the Polaroid held by the shaggy young man in the trilby hat and unfortunate glasses. The boy's vintage Polaroid SX-70 flashed, clacked, and whirred again, then stuck out its still-developing picture like a one-eyed robot giving Hodge the old raspberry. Katie Kay's slender man fluttered flaccidly behind the young man, like an inverted windsock over a whooshing steam grate. The shaggy young dandy plucked the second picture from the camera, self-consciously shaking it like a Polaroid picture. He glanced at Hodge, and the smile dropped from beneath his Victorian mustache. "'You okay, my man?' he asked, his concern both obvious and honest. He set the picture-holding hand on Hodge's shoulder and looked into the lecturer's face, scanning his eyes. Hodge caught his breath. "'Yes,' he said finally. "'You just... uh, startled me.' Someone cut the power to the slender man midway through Hodge's sentence— and he realized he was yelling. The mustachioed elf smiled honestly and patted Hodge on the back. You're okay, my man, he said. And that whole thing, (laughs) that was priceless. Hodge watched the fake slender man list to starboard, lean into the pines, and gracefully deflate. He finally saw it for what it was, one of those flailing-arm inflatable tube men, the kind used car dealers use to draw the attention of passing motorists. The only difference was that this arm-flailing inflatable tall boy was entirely matte black instead of bright googly-eyed spangles. Hodge wondered if it was custom-made, and then wondered where one got a custom-made parking lot arm-flailer. Then he wondered if he was about to swoon. "'Check out the pics!' the mustachioed boy enthused pulling Hodge back to solid ground. The first wasn't that great. Just a pudgy man in a herringbone jacket with leather patches at the elbows, cowering before what was quite obviously an inflatable air dancer. But the second was pretty priceless. Hodge had evidently sprang back on his heels and thrown back his head after cowering failed to dispel the terrible dark interloper. In the picture, it seemed as though he was so frightened that his hair was actually standing on end. With his hands to his cheeks and eyes wide, he looked like a spontaneous parody of Edvard Munch's scream, with the added refinement that, for whatever reason, 
Hodge had stuck out his tongue in mortal terror. In brief, he looked like a complete blithering jackass. Hodge offered a smile composed equally of embarrassment, relief, and fake bonhomie. As it turned out, Katie Kay was not the daughter of a Sanilac soy farmer, let alone a U.M. dropout. She was from Cincinnati and was in her final year of Central Michigan University's new media program, just back from a New York internship with the Gawker Media Network, for whom she was on assignment and by whom she hoped to ultimately be employed. Hodge signed the photo release forms. He didn't want to seem like a bad sport and accepted a case of Monster Energy drink, which wasn't really related to this project, he was advised, but left over from some promotional thing. The kids, who seemed like basically good kids, didn't want him to go away empty-handed. The young man with the camera thought Gawker would send Hodge an iTunes gift card once the article went up, but wasn't sure. Hodge nodded and asked if that was all. He was pleased to learn that he would not have to drive Katie Kay back to Mount Pleasant. The mustachioed young man, it turned out, had plenty of room in his burgundy scion. Gawker published the piece a week later, and Hodge was surprised to see that the byline for Ten Debunkers Getting Punked was indeed Katie Kay. He just assumed it was a fake name as he mulled it all over during his long drive back to Indiana. The hours of corn and light industrial park punctuated only by brief stops at any available public toilet. The monster evidently did not agree with his stomach. The article came to the immediate attention of his colleagues. The ribbing was light but persistent. If there was any comfort to be had... It was that the Polaroids of Hodge's comical terror had earned the place of honor at the end of the remarkably ad-festooned, pointlessly paginated article. A good portion of Hodge's cohorts got annoyed before reaching his photo. Those who persevered through all the click-throughs made a point of emailing him, so that Professor Hodge knew they were up to date with his latest publication. Yes, they were mocking him but he took some comfort in knowing that at least he was worth mocking. Even that was an achievement for a folklorist. His editor, who was optimistically young, thought the article, which was moderately popular, would help spur advance sales of the monograph Hodge had been preparing about the Slender Man phenomenon and Wendigo imagery in digital America. He offered to double the print run. There would still be no advance. One Monday afternoon, a month after ten debunkers getting punked went online, Hodge made the long drive back to Mount Pleasant, Michigan. Autumn had dried, shriveled, and blown away by then, leaving a hard, frosted husk. Fitful little eddies of snow periodically swirled through his headlights, but nothing seemed determined to stick. Hodge, who had been following at the real Ms. Katie K on Twitter, drove directly to the little pin on Google Maps corresponding to the location of most of her Monday evening tweets. He wasn't surprised to find himself parking in front of an architecturally ambitious building with new media etched into the green-tinted glass facade. Hodge sunk low in the driver's seat as Ms. K exited the building, the same large messenger bag slung across her chest. She walked quickly, munching an apple, her shoulders drawn up against the night chill. Hodge slipped out of his car and jogged up behind her. Uh, Ms. K, he called from a good dozen feet away. Ms. Katie K. She turned, and Hodge immediately smiled in greeting. I thought that was you, he said jovially, like a teacher greeting a much-adored former student. Katie puckered in bemused confusion. Professor Hodge? He didn't correct her. (laughs) How nice to run into you. Why are you... He waved his hand dismissively, said professional affiliation, as though the phrase explained his inexplicable appearance in mid-Michigan, then rushed on. I'm 
So glad to have bumped into you. I never got your contact information after we met. She looked even more confused. I was hoping you could do me a favor. Her features clouded. Maybe. She said cautiously, glancing from left to right. The street was empty, but Hodge saw her eye catch on the blue emergency phone three quick strides down the sidewalk. Do you uh, still have the, the Polaroid? She was already shaking her head. Gawker kept those when I mailed them to scan. They loaned me the camera and paid for the film. Hodge smiled and shook his head. No, not those pictures. Uh, I can download those. I mean the, um, the, the bait picture. The Polaroid you initially used to fool me. It wasn't reproduced in the, um, article. She smiled, clearly relieved. Yeah, I've got that. She snorted, digging into her large bag. Actually, this is funny. It's still in my bag. I came across it when I was looking for my soda in the middle of class. She dug and dug, finally surfacing with the creased Polaroid showing the burgundy scion and denuded birches, an ersat slender man shucking and jiving beyond. She handed the photo over. Hodge glanced at it. He didn't want to draw attention, struggling not to stare before slipping the Polaroid into his jacket pocket. All yours. Why do you want it? She asked lightly, more conversational than actually curious. Hodge wasn't prepared for this question. Uh, my editor, he blurted. My I, publisher uh, for my upcoming Slenderman book. Thought we should perhaps include an afterword about the Gawker piece, and it would be nice to include this photo... We might, we might even go for color to catch those wonderful reds and earth tones. This was a lie. Hodge had never told anyone about this picture's existence, and didn't intend for any living soul to ever see it. Thanks so much, he said. This is going to be great. He offered her a ride, which she gladly accepted. It turned out her apartment was not at all close. It was a white-knuckled drive for Hodge. He sat in his car and watched as she punched in her code at the front door before the watchful eye of the apartment's security camera. He wanted to be sure she got home safe and sound, and that her doing so was documented. Hodge did not drive home from Ms. Katie Kay's apartment. Instead, he drove dead east to Sanilac. But before he got to the little two-track... He pulled off the road, tugging his protesting hybrid beneath the low trees. He looked at Katie Kay's Polaroid for a long, long time, marveling not at the colors he'd admired out on the winter-cold sidewalk, nor at her terrifying, spastic faux slender man. What kept him wrapped was the tall, gaunt, indistinct figure, almost out of the frame, at the far left edge of the photo. This slender man also stood tall, and was also blurred with motion. It beckoned with one elongated arm, its penetrating gaze seemingly fixed out of frame. To whom did it beckon? Hodge wondered. How many slender men walked these woods? He had not seen this figure when Katie Kay had first shown him the photo. Only later as he brooded over the picture of her picture that he'd taken with his phone. And once seen, he could not unsee it, nor tolerate the notion that some day she or anyone else might glance at the photo again and abruptly see that other slender man in her Polaroid, that true slender man, the one they hadn't been prepared for, and thus could not notice. Hodge marveled at this slender man, because he seemed to almost be able to distinguish features on that void head, cocked with bemused curiosity. He marveled because the picture was taken in Sanilac, near the petroglyphs, warning of the deprivations of the Wendigo. The last time Hodge had walked those forests had been long before the advent of photography, and even then he'd never beckoned to anyone. There'd never been anyone to beckon to. Finally, Hodge marveled at his own restraint. 
Ms. KDK had been in his car, so close that the summer fruit market smells of her shampoo and conditioner had enveloped him and still clung to his winter coat. And he was so hungry. He hadn't eaten in months, and the weather was growing cold and tight and hard when the hunger had always been its worst. He got out of the car and stretched, his back and neck cracking as he wrung the stiffness from his shoulders. He undressed, folding his clothes neatly on the driver's seat. Then he stretched again, stretched differently, extending up into the depthless, moonless air, his arms and legs pulling like darkening taffy, growing slim and, in some respect, dim, growing cold. His breath was icy in the icy breeze, his taut skin crinkled like dry leaves. The dark forest seemed to grow day-bright to his new ice-film eyes. The Ojibwe used to say that the most important thing for a hunter is to help the prey reassure itself that he doesn't even exist. Over time, the Wendigo that concealed itself within chubby James Hodge, which had even begun to think of itself as the Slender Man, had grown to agree. It held the Polaroid picture pressed between its long, pale, icy palms, until the sudden cold spoiled the emulsion. When it released the photograph, it was just a black square framed in white, a dark window in which one might only see herself. Bad film. Despite its hunger, the companionless thing that had followed the Ojibwe to this land did not turn towards the twinkling lights of the isolated farmhouse out in the stubbly shorn fields. It turned instead to the dark forest, slashed with the spectral white birch trunks. More urgent than the opportunity to ease its insatiable hunger was the very real possibility of finally sating its loneliness. And the slender man smiled, despite the cold and the hunger that twisted in its guts like wire. Because it's always nice to be somewhere where you can just be yourself. The End Author's Note I think what always comes to mind with this story for me is that I'm one of those bonsai writers. You start with this little shrub of a story scrap, and you try and trim it and cultivate it and help it to become the best little miniature little tree it can be. Which also means that, more often than not, I start out thinking I'm going for one thing, but the way the story twists and grows, it winds up being something really different. I think the initial inspiration of this story is pretty obvious. I wrote it when the Slender Man was still a pretty new urban myth and have a long-standing fascination with pre-Native American, uh, once called Southern Death Cult, indigenous myths like the Wendigo and the fabulous Night Panther. From there, the horror story sort of writes itself. But this story twisted and branched as it grew in ways I hadn't anticipated. In the end, this wound up being my love letter to that great unsung low-wage post-industrial American worker the adjunct professor. Stay strong, brothers and sisters. Also always appreciate it if you point folks to my website, davidericnielsen.com, and shill my existing stories. Folks can find my novella, There Was a Crooked Man, He Flipped a Crooked House, in print, ebook, and audio on Amazon. All right, so there you go. That's the story. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Now now that we're on the other side, Rich Outfield, can you tell us more about what you thought? You, you, you left us hanging. You, you tantalized us with some kind of interesting story waiting to be told. Okay, you have oversold the hell out of that. Because <laughs> obviously I liked the story. I wouldn't have pestered him about doing it on our show and spent the countless hours that it has taken me to do this episode but, yeah, that's something that I did want to talk about with you. It was part of the reason that I wanted to run this story is because I thought it lent itself to an interesting discussion afterward. 
Oh, okay. But before we get to anything interesting at all, I just wanted to say thank you for adding your voice to the story and to Tina Kolakowski, who somehow I can still say her name all these years later for <laughs> doing the voice of KDK. And, uh, yeah, Tina Kawakalaki did a really good job <laughs> doing the voice of KDK this time around. And I was, yeah, thanks a lot for doing that for us, Tina Kasalowski. That was great. Um, I mean, I can ask you what you thought of the story if you would like. But the thing that, that I'll just get out of the way is, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to dredge up my beefs with other podcasts or other podcast listeners, but I, I you recall that Escape Pod was a big influence on us, and we really enjoyed listening to their show for years. And I always wanted to narrate a, a story on Escape Pod. I don't know if that was one of your aspirations. I did want to do that. That was one that uh, we've never been asked to do. I'm pretty sure we've done one on all the other Escape Artists, though, haven't we? We have. And yeah, we, we used to bother the people over there with, uh, you know. Did you get our last email? re-narrating a story on your podcast. But if you recall, I uh, stereotyped the average Escape Pod listener as that story was so predictable. And yeah, it, that was the most common comment. That's the thing is I would go to their forums and invariably, I, it sounds like an exaggeration, but in every one about a story, somebody complained that they knew how it was going to end or that it was predictable or they could see the ending coming a mile away or they read the title of the story and they knew how it was going to end. And it frustrated me because you, you know, when you and I were aspiring writers, we wanted to get our stuff out there. And in my opinion, Escape Pod was where it was at. That's where they ran like the best stories. Uh-huh. Until the Dune Steve came along. <laughs> okay, and, and you know, that's that's fair. That's totally fair. But while I was reading this story, The Slender Men, I had no idea where it was going. And I'd be like, okay, I think I know. I think I know now where... And I was wrong. <laughs> and there are two or three moments that seem to be telegraphing. Okay, this is the ending of the story. And that, that turns out not to be right. And that's something I really just wanted to talk to you about is, did you predict what was going to happen at the end of this story at any point? No, not at all. I didn't even predict, like, okay, so when they get out there and they go to the place, I assumed that she was feeding him to a Slender Man, more or less, you know? Not that she was a Slender Man, which then it starts to seem that that is the case. <laughs> But then that also is not the case, and I would have never suspected that they were they had a blow up guy. What do they what do they call those things? A windy guy, a wavy A windigo, yes. <laughs> yeah, a wind ego. I would have never guessed that they were just punking him. Ten debunkers get punked. I I never would have guessed that that was what was gonna happen. And then when that did happen, I could see, because I was looking at the file, that there was still several minutes to go in the story. And I kept thinking, oh, okay, now these people are going to go away. And then the Windigo is coming for real. The Slender Man is coming for real. But no, because he immediately starts talking about the article coming out on Gawker or whatever and how nobody could get to the end of it and actually see the picture of him because I couldn't stand having to click through a thousand pages. And um, <laughs> that really rang truer than anything else in this entire story. <laughs> but uh, then the, the what, what did happen at the end, all of that stuff, you know. Well, he, okay, so he goes and he tracks her down on campus. And I was like, oh, okay, here we go. I, I guess he took this... Uh, humiliation pretty personally because yeah there could be only one reason why you go to track down this girl right oh and she's getting in a car with him okay you know and it didn't go that way either yep and he made certain that she made it home and that there was records of it and all that <laughs> you could see the camera or whatever it never went the way you expected 
To the point where when it ended, I thought, okay, I, yeah, I better rewind that and check and make sure I got what I got out of it. And I listened. Oh, okay. Yeah, that is how it ended. And I even called you before we started recording and made sure, hey, this is what I think happened in this story. <laughs> is it what you think happened in that story too? Because I want to make sure <laughs> that I'm not looking like an idiot when we do the episode. Yeah, so so, so let me add one more penny to the two cents that I've already given. You can still enjoy something knowing how it's going to end. Even if you predict that the guy and the girl are going to get together after not liking each other on the train, you can enjoy the ride and you can enjoy the movie just as much knowing how it's going to end. I just, I never understood why that makes you superior to what you read that you knew how it was going to end. One of the joys that I would get out of horror movies, especially the slasher movies, is watching and being like, okay, this guy's going to buy it. Oh, this guy's totally dead. Her, she's going to survive till the end. And you could see that like from the very beginning, just based on the characters that they gave these guys. And it's still totally fun to watch a movie like that. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with a movie like that. And a lot of times it's fun to see if you guessed right. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah, that guy did buy it and he bought it this way, just like I thought. Oh, yeah, this guy was the guy whose head wound up in the toilet. I knew it was going to be him. I, you know, that's that's my opinion. But of, of somebody that reads stories or listens to podcasts, well, I've never been given a medal or a trophy for figuring out how a story was going to end before it ended. Really? I've got a whole wall of medals. Uh, yeah, see, I, I had <laughs> like two digits reversed on my address. Uh, so all okay. the many, many people that complain about Escape Pod, they got their trophies as well, and I never got mine. There's some stranger in Dubuque that is continually <laughs> getting these. And he's like, damn it, I don't even like Podsicles. And so that, that was part of what I wanted to talk to you about. But then the other part, the other part that struck home for me on this story is, so our main character is approached by Katie K. And she is clearly a believer in this stuff. Like, like a, an honest to goodness, whatever the opposite of a skeptic is. And, you know, he tries to explain how the Slender Man is a hoax and where it came from. And he's got all this evidence. And she doesn't even listen. She just goes on because she's just sure that these things are real. And it reminded me of my uncle... Uh -huh. of whom I've spoken many times on this show with you. And then times when we weren't podcasting where I just had to call you and talk about something <laughs> that he said or uh, an experience that he recounted. Or uh, And, and if, if this is your first episode of The Dune Steve, he believes so sincerely in the occult, in the supernatural, in ghosts, in evil spirits, in like beings that live among us and single certain people out to mess with them, I guess. I, I, I've never really understood. But he 100% sincerely a believer in this sort of thing. And he will tell these stories and he, like, he becomes emotional telling these stories to the point where it's just like, I don't doubt for a second that you believe that this happened. But... If that were to happen to me, I would be in a padded cell right now. <laughs> and I don't understand how these things can continue to happen to you over and over and over again. And I've asked my mom about it. You know, she's his big sister. And she says, things have always happened to him ever since he was a little kid. Things that didn't happen to the rest of us. And I don't know that she is a believer in the occult, in the way that my uncle is, but she believes that he is special in some way or has been singled out in some way and believes that these things have actually happened to him. And again, I just, I, I have this reservation because it's not just one thing or five things, but we're talking about, at this point, 60 or 70 or 80 experiences with the supernatural throughout his life. In the same way that in Cabot Cove, you know, 
there's an old lady and every week somebody gets murdered on Cabot Cove and luckily Jessica Fletcher is there to get to the bottom of it. But it's just like, how in the crap can there be 50 murders in your little town every year, Jessica? You know what I mean? Yeah, what's going on in that place, man? Well, you know, I've, I've lived in this town for 10 years now, and I've only killed three people. I mean, I've only, I'm aware of three murders on this street. <clears throat> but anyhow, <laughs> the, the most recent story that he told was about something coming to the foot of his bed when he was a little kid. And he would just pull himself under the covers and just cry and pray and wait for it to go away. And it would shake the bed and it wanted him to come out and he could feel its presence there. And when he was old enough, when he was nine or ten or maybe younger than that, he went to to the, the library in town and he had asked the librarian, are there any books about things that come to your room? And she's like, things that come to your room? And he says, you know, things. And they're by your bed. And they shake the bed and they want you to pull the blankets out. And my uncle, a 55-year-old man, was crying, telling this story about saying this to the librarian. And the librarian is just like, oh my gosh, honey, where's your mother? What can I get you? He, and, and I was just chilled to see this man cry, telling this story that still affects him 40-something years later. And I just, I, once it was over, I was just like, how? How can this be? For he is the Kwisatz Haderach. <laughs> no, how can, you know what I mean? How can this stuff actually... How can he not be crazy? Right. And I don't have an answer, but I thought about it with this. Like everything that James Hodge says to this woman, she's got an answer for. Because she knows that these things are real. And I've heard my uncle's little brother say... Well, yeah, you know, maybe there was a flash in the light bulb. Uh, You know, sometimes you get a power surge and things. You know, like these old houses. We lived in shitty old houses. And they're always settling. And there's always noises. And it's like, we were in Southern California. There are earthquakes. Things that shake. You know, it's just like, okay. yeah. He has all of these answers. All of these excuses for why this can't be. Spirits or beings or whatever. And my uncle's just like, no. Now, he refutes every single one of them. And, and so I was brought back to that when KDK is trying to convince him that Slendermen have existed for all these years, despite having been created in, what, 2009? Yeah, that's... I was going to say, I don't know anybody that is like that. I don't know anybody who really believes in ghosts. Other than, like, I don't know, little children, I guess. They always... They, they, they can find something scary in anything like my seven-year-old he's always oh i heard a noise outside or oh there was this or there was that and so he's down sleeping in my bed again and making my night miserable but an adult (laughs) a person who's gotten to the point where they can understand that that stuff is more their invention than something that actually happened you know that's what i was gonna say when you say how can he think that he's seeing this stuff and not be crazy or oh, why does this stuff keep happening you know the 50 murders and I, I only know about three people that i killed i mean that were killed wow you were really paying attention <laughs> you know when i when i hear that i think it's more the person that it's happening to and their willingness to believe something so anything weird happens And they're willing to go right to that, okay, this has got to be a ghost, or it's got to be a a Wendigo, or a Wendigo, as I would say. Did it bother you that I said Wendigo? No. I've heard it said both ways. Well, Hodges said it both ways in the story, but... uh... Yeah, and only three of the people that said it the other way did I kill. I mean, were killed... (laughs) So it doesn't really bother me that bad, as you can tell. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, you know, th- those are the kind of people that that kind of stuff happens to a lot. It seems to me anyways, in my experience, maybe I am the, the stupid skeptic that's totally wrong. And that stuff is all real. 
and it's not all in their mind, and it's not weird that it keeps happening to them because they know the people that can see them or something, and they go to those people, and it's not just that that person is a particularly gullible or, you know, whatever kind of a person, and that's why they're always the ones that believe. Well, okay, I I hear you, but it seems like if any of the things that my uncle describes happened to you or to me, we would be believers. Because, okay, a story that he used to eat out on all the time was going to a beach in, uh, I don't know if it was Guatemala or Mexico. The, you know, they were at the beach and a dead body rose to the surface of the water while he was there. I guess this guy had drowned like three days earlier and people had been looking for him, the body, you know, hoping uh, because they didn't find the body that he had somehow been okay. I don't know if the guy had been boating or swimming. I think he had been in swimming. And this body comes up to the surface while my uncle is there. And he's told this story and I just remember freaking out when I was a kid. I was about 10 when he first told this story because it had just happened to him. And uh, yeah, okay, that, there's no, nothing supernatural there. Although the way he tells it, yes, there is a supernatural element <laughs> to it. But it's just like, that has never happened to me. Right. And I, if it did, I would never go in the ocean again. <laughs> and would you? Can you imagine seeing a dead body float up to the... I, oh my gosh. Yeah, I have a hard... I mean, we went to the ocean not too long ago. And my wife was swimming around in the water and a stingray came up right next to her. And she freaked out. She's like, oh my gosh, it's a shark. And she got up and was running out of that water until she looked back and said, oh, it's it's not a shark. Because you know how rays sometimes like go up sideways and their little sure, sure, yeah. wings or whatever will flap around a little. So that's what she saw flapping up out of the water. And she was sure it was a shark. She ran out. She sat there for a while. And then she finally like, okay, I think it's safe. I can get back. Surely the stingray has gone away. And so she went back into the water. And then it came up and she saw it again right next to her. And freaked out and ran out again. She's like, all right, I'm not getting back in. (laughs) And that's just a a stingray, which, granted, a stingray did kill the crocodile hunter. But generally, they're not really that dangerous. You can... I I don't know. I I suppose they're not stingrays. Those aren't the ones that you pet in the little pool at SeaWorld or whatever. They probably just have other kinds of rays, like manta rays or something that can't sting you. But I want to say that they did have stingrays in those. And if that's true, they can't be very dangerous. I guess if it hits you right in the heart like it did to Steve Irwin, then you will die. But most likely you'll be fine. You might have an owie. But again, if that if that were possible, if even an owie were possible, they wouldn't let you play with them on, and all that. Yeah, that's probably true. Not in SeaWorld. But yeah, even just the thought of that makes me not want to get back into the ocean. I, I mean, we, we have a pool and sometimes we take the little floaty things out in the pool. And I thought, oh, I wonder if this would be fun to take to the beach and just, you know, you get on top of this thing and you just float around while the waves push you around and stuff. Would that be cool? Because I remember a kid was on one of those in Jaws. But then if I remember right, the kid was eaten and the little floaty thing <laughs> came in without him on it. It had blood on it. Right. So, you know, it wasn't that bad. But it didn't have him on it. And so, yeah, just thinking about that, I think, oh, that might be fun. But no, no, that's how the kid died in Jaws. So I will not be doing that. So it doesn't take much to get me to not want to get in the water. So, yeah, finding a dead body, yeah, it would probably be a good while. Well, I felt like that was an example that I could share because, yeah, just that that would be it. I, I, I don't know. I mean, how long would you not be able to sleep having seen that? What the, what the ocean does to a person after being dead, dude. It just, hmm. Yeah, it would be pretty gruesome. But anyhow, I, you know, according to my uncle, this sort of stuff follows him around wherever he goes. And I, I know I've told stories about it on this show. And I, whenever we do a Halloween marathon or a Halloween episode, I, I, I try and share a new story that he has told. And I just, I don't understand that. And maybe... He shakes his head, you know, if he had heard this, of just like, you know, how can somebody not believe? But it's just, it's it's hard for me to believe. 
Yeah, I think if you aren't there or whatever, then you can easily shake it off. You know what I mean? It's, yeah, whatever. That guy says that, but that's not true. He just thinks that. He's, he's effing with me or whatever. But somebody that sees the dead body and the grotesquery of it and all that stuff, they, they probably have a different opinion of that story. Yeah, I don't know. It's much easier to be a skeptic of things and to, and to demand evidence. Although I think humans have a tendency to want to believe like Mulder in his poster or whatever about wanting to believe, you know. You know, I've heard it explained uh, in books talking about evolution and stuff where they're just like, yeah, you know, if you're in the, or no, you're on the savanna and you hear a, a leaf crackle and you start and you look and you try and find the lion that is stalking you, it's much better to do that than to automatically dismiss the leaf crackling because it's better to have the false positive than the false negative because if you get the false negative well then you just assumed it wasn't a lion and but it was and the lion ate you and you therefore didn't go on to have offspring that carried that genetic trait of having the false negative but the false positive persists because yeah the people who believed and were wrong well they're still around and uh, those that didn't believe and were wrong, those ones aren't around. So I guess it's a, it's a human trait to want to believe. And like they talked about in the story, you know, finding patterns in things that don't exist. People talk about the, the face on Mars. You know, there's supposedly a face. It looks like a face. Somebody must have made it. There must be some aliens that made it. But, you know, you get a different picture of the same place from a different angle or something like that. Oh, there's no face. It's just so happened that, you know, the light hit it just right during this picture so that there's a face on there. And yeah, people are always looking for patterns in things because that's how we evolved to be what we are, making patterns out of things and then, you know, using that to our advantage. You know, maybe we'll get a lot of false positives that way, but... I guess that's just the way we're going to be. And maybe it can be stupid. Maybe it leads to Salem witch trials and things like that. But it also led to civilization. So there's that. Yeah, talking about evolution is funny. It reminds me of there was a term, a scientific term for when a, a baby is cute. Oh, yeah. And it was an evolutionary term where the more it's, the term is you know the name the term is neoteny is that what it is yep but it's like the cuter that a newborn that a child or a baby animal is the greater chance it has that someone will protect it that someone will feed it someone will coddle it someone will help it grow to adulthood and the cute ones <laughs> live long enough to have offspring whereas yeah. the ugly ones don't hence the reason why so many baby animals are cute or baby human beings are cute yeah and i tell me what that name is again uh neoteny and that's a thing that can persist you know into older i mean that you can look at that and that's the older animals that have traits that look like younger animals will also be protected as well and so you'll see you know like like women don't grow beards for example like men do and that's a neotenous trait where they they still look like young beings because of that and men will tend to be chivalrous they'll they'll protect them it's a yeah it gives you an evolutionary advantage not, not in any more Wow, you're you're pretty educated. I'm I'm impressed about that. <laughs> the other day I was talking to my niece about World War II and she said, "You know what you're doing right now?" And I said, "What?" And she says, "You're mansplaining." <laughs> and I was like, "Nope. I'm college graduate explaining to a high school dropouting." <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I became so angry about that. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that quite that term quite applies when it comes to the Second World War. 
She's like, hey, I lived through the Second World War. You didn't. Why are you trying to tell me about it? <laughs> Sorry, I do, if, what you haven't done in Dune, Stephen, so effing long. Do I need to cut that line out? I don't know. Probably it's fine. Uh, I did want to get back to the... Uh... Neotony? Yeah, Neotony and why you brought it up. You just want an excuse to say Neotony and prove that you are smart. <laughs> yep. I did. I I needed that ego boost. I just I don't don't get it very often, unfortunately. <clears throat> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, so so uh, why were you asking about that? I wasn't asking about anything. Well, you brought you it. were just saying that it's an evolutionary trait to the you know that we see faces that we see. You 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 brought up the face on Mars. Uh huh. And seeing patterns. I, our minds are set up for that from birth. That, you know, you see the eyes and the nose and the mouth. That is the provider. Yeah. That is mother kind of thing. And we look for it for the rest of our lives. Or I do, at least. I see faces everywhere. And, of course, I'm, I'm probably a little bit more mentally ill than most. Because I have this terrible overactive imagination that still Fs with me. I went to the cabin with my brother yesterday to chop down some trees and I casually mentioned that I was, I freaked myself out the last time that I was there by myself and had to sleep with the lights on. And he's just like, <laughs> you slept with the lights on. Ha ha. You know, he thought I was joking because what a pathetic, <laughs> stupid thing to do. But I do freak myself out. I mean, maybe I'm closer <laughs> to my uncle than I thought. But it's just like, I have this imagination and I imagine what's the worst thing that I could see when I look at the top of the stairs right now. And for a split second, it's there. Uh Just, you know, uh, the next day, you know, the sun came out and I woke up and all the lights were still on and I just laughed at it. You know, it's just like, that's ridiculous. You know, the, the thought that had jumped into my head that made me be like, oh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm leaving that light on. (laughs) <laughs> it was so stupid and silly. But at the time, at like two in the morning or whenever it was that it came into my head, I was just like, oh, dude, that would be so horrible. Oh, man. You know, it's like if I saw that in a movie, if, if I could recreate that for a movie f- or for a story, it would scare the pants off of people. You know what I mean? I have this, I, I want to say, creative evolutionary advantage, but... It becomes a disadvantage when I'm up at the cabin by myself right. with nobody else around. I hope. Yeah, well, you know, it's better to have a false positive than a false negative. So, you know, you, you, so you left the lights on. Did that damage you in any way? Just in the eyes of my brother. Mm. But if you turned the lights off and then the monster came scrambling up the stairs and eviscerated you, then that would have been a problem. So, you know. Okay. Well, thank you an evolutionary advantage thank you if, if you wouldn't mind texting that same sentiment to my brother <laughs> there's much less detriment to a false positive than a false negative so you know it's okay and i i know how you feel i'm not i don't think nearly as much that way as you are but it happens oh my gosh not too long ago i went to Hobby Lobby because my daughter needed some kind of art supplies or something like that. And I went there with my son and he always finds something that he has to have at every store. Doesn't matter what store we go to, there's something and he wants it and he's going to cry for it. It can be pretty frustrating and a lot of times he picks something that's just too damn expensive to give in for, you know. This time around, I think he picked some kind of sculpting clay or something like that. I want to make something with this. And I thought, okay, uh, listen, here's the deal. And so I told him, okay, we're going to Walmart right after this. I'm sure they have some kind of sculpting clay there too. And I'm sure it's half the price that it is here at Hobby Lobby. So (laughs) we'll get it there, okay? And so we drove to Walmart, and (laughs) they don't have sculpting clay, unfortunately. So he was pretty irritated with me. And so instead, what he decided to get was, in the little craft aisle, they have these styrofoam heads that, like, I guess you put, like, a wig on. 
or something like that. Like it's it's the thing that you keep your wigs on to keep them head shaped so they don't get all wrinkled or whatever. And I'm sure there's probably other uses for them as well, which is what my son came up with. He decided that was the thing that he wanted is a styrofoam head. <laughs> and so that's what we got for him. And he went home and he painted this head. He painted its skin color and then he painted its eyes. He painted like green eyes onto it and he painted lips onto it and all this stuff. <laughs> and oh, it's creepy as heck to look at this thing. It's really just grotesque. And then for some reason he took like the roll that was in the tube that was inside of like a wrapping paper roll and he stuck the head on top of this roll of wrapping paper and then he just kind of left it around like that and he stuck it back behind the cushions on the couch and set it in there and so this head was like sitting there on the couch and like four different times I would walk past that thing and see the head and go oh my gosh this is Oh, I thought that was somebody sitting there. Somebody on the couch. I'm, I'm, there's not supposed to be anybody else in the house but me. How is there somebody, you know? Four different times before I finally went, Holy crap, why have I not moved this stupid head off of the couch? And put it somewhere that it stops fooling me into thinking that there's somebody there. And oh, a few of those times were in the dark. I was walking past couch and saw this head sitting there. And went, oh my gosh, there Oh, it's just the stupid styrofoam head. Well, okay, but big, sorry to interrupt your story, but I mean, I I can't really picture it in my head. I mean, like, how horrifying could this head have been? I mean, what does it look like? Okay, are you familiar with uh, Vera Farmiga? Oh, my God. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Absolutely terrifying. Okay, so, but what, what about your wife? Was she at all freaked out by the Farmiga head? <laughs> I'm, sh- I'm sure. I think she said that she got fooled by it a few times as well. So, just, it's, when you see things, like, out of the corner of your eyes and stuff like that, you know what I mean? Like, you don't get a good enough glimpse to really know what it is. And they'll catch you. Oh, here's another thing that happened the other day. I was... At home, alone, in the morning, and I hear a huge, loud thump from the room above me. And I'm like, uh, what the hell? (laughs) And so I got up, and I walked up the stairs, and I looked in the room, and I didn't see anything. And I looked in the other room, and I looked in the other room, and I just kind of looked around like, what was that? Eventually, I found that it was a spaceship that had fallen off of my son's shelf up on the wall and landed on the floor. At least I think that's what it was. I found a spaceship on the floor and it normally is up there. So I guessed that that was what happened. But why would it have fallen off in the middle of the day when no one was home? I guess maybe the friction that was holding it in place finally gave way. I don't know. But yeah, weird. Well, I'm sure my uncle would have a different answer than you do. But yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, if I was your uncle, I would be like, oh, yes, it was this. It was my grandmother who come to visit me, and she wanted to get my attention. But the, No, but the spirits are never benign to my uncle. They're always, <laughs> always, whatever the opposite of benign is, uh, it's a, they're, they're always malignant. Ooh. And so, <laughs> from the French word for uh, Angelina Jolie. Ah. But, Sorry. I, now I'm thinking of Vera Farmiga sitting at your couch. <laughs> like, I call the police, it's Vera Farmiga back again. Uh, <laughs> well, anyhow, I feel like this was an interesting discussion about belief. And uh, just, yeah, as, a, as a, a postscript, the guy that created the Slender Man, you know, the, the, the something awful forums guy, uh-huh. I'm so jealous of that. In the same <laughs> way that you used to say, I'll know I've made it when somebody makes an action figure of a character that I created. I just The fact that two teenage girls tried to murder their, their, their schoolmate to appease the Slender Man, it's just like, how proud must this guy be that this <laughs> thing that he created as, as like a lark has that kind of influence. 
yeah, I, th- th- those girls stabbed this other kid 19 times. I don't really want that. To tell you the truth, I don't want somebody to stab someone else 19 times. How about three? Because of a character that I created. <laughs> three, uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess in the end, it depends on how good you are with the knife. I mean, the girl who was stabbed 19 times lived. <laughs> so how that happens, I don't know. If somebody was stabbed three times and they died, I guess that's worse. So I guess everything's uh, relative. But that is impressive to create a, something like Slender Man and it to just take off the way that it has. 2009, that was only 10 years ago. That was after the Dune Steve audio fiction magazine began that that first image was was made. And it's so well known now, only 10 years later. Well, it's kind of like George Romero creating the zombie as we know it and never getting any credit or never getting any money for it. The, The Victor Surge guy has to be just like kicking himself whenever... There's a new documentary about it. It's like, oh, there's another horror movie about the Slender Man that just came. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, Steve Buscemi is voicing the Slender Man in the next Simpsons movie. And it's like, <laughs> oh, I could be somebody, he, you know, who owns his own house from the Slender Man. Yeah, uh, just by way of that. And my, my guess is he doesn't. Probably not from riches that he gained by way of creating the Slender Man, at least. Which, yeah, that does feel like a, a really sad thing that you just kind of threw it out. I, I don't know. Maybe maybe he doesn't care. Maybe that's just the fact that there is a movie he thinks is so amazingly awesome and doesn't care that he's rolling in it or not for it. But, you know, who knows? All I want to be is paid in action figures of the characters that I create. That's all. You know, that was part of Mark Hamill's contract is that he gets a copy of everything with his likeness on it. Oh, nice. So I'm sure his kids would get invited to everybody's birthday party. (laughs) They're just like, huh, I wonder what the Hamels are going to give me this year. (laughs) Oh, wow, Luke Skywalker on paper towel. Oh, Bespin Luke again. Yay. I'll put it up here with my others. But yeah, that would be cool. I don't know. I I think of the uh, Carrie Fisher's little show that she did, her one-woman show, Punk and Drublick. Wishful drinking. Wishful drinking, that's it. And, you know, they have the part where, like, the life-size, cartoony-looking Carrie Fisher, She I think she calls it a sex toy, <laughs> but, you know, the life-size one comes down out of the sky and she goes over and stands next to it and, and stuff and... That would be interesting just for there to be like if I was an actor and there was an action figure made of me. Oh, my gosh. Would I want 20 of them at least? I would. Oh, I would just find that to be so awesome. Well, I told you I may, I'm sure I've told you because I tell this story as much as my uncle tells the dead body floating up from the, the ocean story. But the guy who played Squidhead, I interviewed him. And he was astounded. He, it wasn't until 20 years after Return of the Jedi came out that he even knew that there were fans of him, that there would be people that would want his autograph, that there would be people that had action figures of the character that he played. And to hear his just like delight that he's like, did you know that my character has a name? His name is not Squidhead, but it's Tessic. And, I, and to hear the delight of him telling this, it's like there, there are stories written about his character, somebody that he played for like a week in 1982. Right. Oh my gosh, I was delighted to hear how happy he was about that. And it just seems like, okay, yeah, that's the best possible version of that. You know, somebody who's just tickled pink to find this stuff out. <laughs> and I don't know that that's connected to yours at all. But he was just so happy that anybody would want to talk to him, much less get his autograph. No, it is. That's cool. I know I've seen various things on like, I don't know, Entertainment Tonight or one of those kind of shows where they'll take the action figures, go with like the new Star Wars movie or whatever, and they'll 
show them to the stars as they're coming in on the red carpet or something like, oh, what do you think of this? And I remember, uh, I guess this one that I'm thinking of was for the prequels. And they gave Natalie Portman the Queen Amidala, or I guess it was called Padme at this point, because this was for Attack of the Clones. They're like, yeah, look, here's your figure. And and she was looking at it like, oh, wow, look at this figure. It's so cool. And look at how big my boobs are or something like that. I just find that would be so neat to have somebody hand over, hey, look at this figure that I made of you. And you look at it and you're like, wow, that's, that's a representation of me. And the cool thing is, too, like these days, like if you've seen some of the face printing technology they have or whatever they really look like you that would be almost creepy maybe <laughs> to get one you're like uh it's like i'm looking in a mirror well for me i'd say uh you'd be like hey how are you doing look at how good looking i am i didn't i didn't even realize i was this good looking <laughs> well it's so rare that you can see you know like the side of your face and the back of your head is <laughs> yeah go and have some quality time with this action figure of you Oh, I think we've wandered far afield on here. <laughs> That's what we do. It's what we live for. But uh, I, yes, I hope that people have enjoyed this hour and a half too. Uh, oh my lord, this extended a period of time they've had with us and <laughs> Slender Men. Yeah, I really want to thank David Eric Nelson for uh, generously sharing this with us, and uh, I might hit him up again. Because I felt like this one came out really well. We'll see, though. When he hears the episode, there will be the unfriended button mashed. Yeah, so he'll smash that unfriend smash, button. Smash, that's what it is. But, uh, yeah, I, I hope that people dug it. And if they didn't, they can dig the... Oh, it's audio. They can't see what I just did. Dang it. Oh, well. Maybe next time there will you'll be able to see audio. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. I hope you enjoyed yourself. And uh, yeah, well, I guess we'll see you next time. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And I believe seeing audio is synesthesia. Oh. Right? Wow. It was my turn to toss out a, a smart person word. That's, I'm, I'm amazed. You must be a college graduate <laughs> and not a high school dropout. Oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> oh, I'll see you, folks. Good night. I believe seeing audio is believing audio. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot make money off it. Believe me, we know that from experience. If you're ever in a generous mood, or even if you're not, we'd love it if you donate. Just press the button on the website to donate $5 a month, a quarter, or choose your own one-time donation amount. From the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine team, good night. Take two. So anyways, mashing the button. Is that is that a euphemism for uh, the man in the boat? No, it's not. No, it's just a thing that people say in the South. They actually use that phrase, like, just mash the button. Oh, my dear God. And so my dad got married to my stepmom, who's from North Carolina. And I think she was taking a picture or something like that for him. And she said, instead of saying, yeah, do you just, so I just press this button. She's like, I just mashed this button here. And my dad's like, oh, no, please don't. Uh, just press it with normal force. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it's just one of those things that he thought was really funny. One of those uh, things that he'd never really heard before. But now that he's married to a Southerner who has uh, a different language... So when I hear people say smash that like button or something, I'm always just like, what? Why are we saying smash? <sighs> yeah, you, I, the, the fact that your dad has a sense of humor is so alien to me. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my dad's a good guy, I have to admit. I went to the cabin on Thursday and it was so cold. 
it got down to 36 degrees outside. So I kept trying to build a fire in the fireplace and it kept going out. And I could just feel my dad's picture in the corner of the room just being like, did nobody ever teach you how to build a fire? Garbage. And I just, yeah. Your dad's picture in the corner of the room keeps rolling its eyes at you. <laughs> Shaking its head. And you're like, stop it, dad. You were supposed to teach me how to build a fire, damn it. All right. And now we're back. Hey, everybody. Let me start over. I pressed the button. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. 